you being here tonight, I don't take it for granted to uh, stand behind uh, the man of God's uh, sacred desk, this pulpit. Uh, if you knew my past, the last place you would expect me to be standing is behind somebody's pulpit. To, uh, but God is a merciful and a good God. Hey, Amen. We had a great time this morning. I want to uh, preach on something a little more serious uh, tonight. It is actually, I believe, along with lust, uh, and uh, this is one of the curses of our generation. And uh, I won't give it away just yet, but if you have your Bibles, you turn with me to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 23. On January 3rd of 2016, I was awakened to a text message uh, that came through my phone about 5.30 in the morning. And the text said these words. It said, hey, pastor, I just got a call that Juan Picasso hung himself last night. Now... This young man, Juan Picasso, was a 28-year-old man. He had been in our church when I pastored in North Carolina. He was in the military, him and his wife, Julie. They had five children. And uh, he had got stationed in Florida. I hadn't talked to Juan or Julie in maybe about a year. And this came from uh, the door director in that North Carolina church, and now I was living in Arizona. And you can imagine when I read the text message that this young man had hung himself. It's 5.30 in the morning. I'm looking at the text and it's almost like, am I reading this correctly? I immediately responded back to this guy, Bobby, who sent the text. I called Bobby and I said, Bobby, what, 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 are you, what is this? What's going on? He said, Pastor, I don't know all the details. All I know is that uh, last I heard that Juan and Julie were having some marital issues and I don't know all the details, et cetera, et cetera. And so we were having men's discipleship that morning in Chandler, in the Chandler church. I got up, I got dressed, I made my way to the church and I sat outside the church and I called Julie. Now mind you, this is a 26 year old young lady with five young children. And I began to talk to her. I said, Julie, what happened? She said, Pastor, I don't know. She said, last night we were having fellowship at our house. They had been out of church for about a year, but she was still using the fellowship terms. And she said, we were having a fellowship at our house. And she said, we went to bed about 1230. It seemed like nothing was wrong. We had a great time. And she said, I woke up this morning to go to work. And she said, when I went to the bathroom door, I could not push it open. She said, I was trying to pry the door open. And long story short, she said, Pastor, when I finally got the door open on the back side of that door was Juan, her husband, and he was hanging there. And he was not alive. I prayed for Julie. I told her, listen, Julie, I'm going to go to church, but I'm going to call you when I get out of service. And she's weeping, of course, and I hung up the phone, and I remember the Chandler Church has a few pillars outside, and I remember sitting down on one of those pillars, and I just began to ask God, I said, God, what in the world? God, what, 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 what happened here? And as I was praying and asking God, I Heard the Spirit of God whispered to me, Tori, do you remember what Juan always had you pray for him about? And the moment that came to my mind, I said, absolutely. Juan always wanted me to pray for him concerning the issue of bitterness. He would talk to me from time to time. He'd come, he'd say, Pastor, can you pray? I'm having some issues in my marriage. And he said, Pastor, I think I'm getting bitter at my wife. And we'd pray and we'd believe God to deliver one of bitterness. And he'd come to me at other times. He would say, Pastor, I feel like uh, I'm being overlooked. He was in the military. He was in E5. And he said every time there was a promotion that came up, it was like they would just overlook him. And he would come and he would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I think I'm getting bitter at my command or my superiors. And we would pray. 
believe God to deliver one of bitterness. And as I was thinking of that sitting there, Spirit of God said, Tori, listen. Bitterness is what took Juan's life. Now when they took an autopsy, no doubt uh, they labeled it death by suicide. But I'm here to tell you tonight that if they were to take a spiritual autopsy, I have no doubt in my mind what they would conclude is that bitterness is what killed Juan. No. In other words, it wasn't so much Juan taking his own life, although we understand accountability and responsibility for our actions, but just as people can overdose, listen to me, on drugs, and we say drugs took their life, or alcohol took their life, I believe with all my heart, uh, people can overdose on bitterness. And bitterness can absolutely take your life. Why? Because bitterness is murderous. But more than that, uh, bitterness like no other emotion is suicidal. Well, um, I want to preach to you tonight a sermon I've entitled The Root of Bitterness. And I want to look at a man who also hung himself. Uh, and though it doesn't look like it on the surface, uh, We'll find that this man was too filled with bitterness. Second Samuel chapter 17, we'll read one verse. And it says in verse 23, Now when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey, he rose, and went home to his house and to his city. He put his household in order, and he hanged himself and died. And he was buried in his father's tomb. A root of bitterness. Let's pray here tonight. Heavenly Father, we come tonight, God, by the grace of God. I pray, God, you would help us navigate the injustices of life, uh, the pain, the rejection, the violations, God. I pray the broken promises, God. I'm asking you, uh, God, that you would uh, help us, give us your spirit, God, that is able to overcome, to thrive in the midst of injustices. I pray, heal broken hearts, uh, marriages, and families, God. Break the curse uh, of bitterness tonight. I thank you for all you are and do. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, a root of bitterness. Now, as I begin studying for this sermon i got my concordance out and i'm looking up bitterness and i saw where of course proverbs tells us that bitterness or envy rots the bones and one of the things i personally like to do whenever i am studying for a sermon i will uh try to find where the topic is first mentioned in the bible how many have heard of the law is first mentioned it is a principle of Bible study that where you find something first mentioned in the Bible, you gain a revelation of how God deals or sees that issue throughout the entire word of God. And so it sets a pattern for a particular thought. And so in the midst of doing that, I came across where bitterness is first mentioned in the Bible. It is Exodus chapter 15, verse 26 through 20 or 22 through 26 now i want to look at this passage because if you can grasp this passage you have a great understanding when it comes to the issue of bitterness verse 22 says so moses brought israel from the red sea then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and they found no water now when they came to mara they could not drink the waters of mara for they were and here's our word they were bitter therefore the name of it was called mara and the people complained against Moses saying what shall we drink and so he cried out to the Lord the Lord showed him a tree when he cast the tree into the water the waters the bitter waters were made sweet there he made a statute and an ordinance for them and there he tested them and said if you diligently heed the voice of your God and do what is right somebody say and do what is right Give ear to his commandments, keep his statutes. I will put none of these diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord 
who heals you. Now, the text you and I just read, this is very interesting time because Israel has just been delivered by 10 incredible plagues. They have been 400 years in bondage and they have just been delivered out of Egypt. They have gotten through the Red Sea. They have uh, seen the entire Egyptian army destroyed. It is a picture of salvation. It is a picture of baptism where the waters come over and cover up the children of Israel. It is a very glorious time. In fact, earlier in the chapter, chapter 15, verse 1, it says that Moses and the people are singing a song to the Lord about triumph and victory and how good God is. They are singing a song about the great majesty of God. Miriam, Moses' sister, the Bible says in verse 20 and 21, the Bible says she grabs her tambourine and she begins to sing a song. And so I I want you to picture the scene now where right before we get to our text everybody's singing everybody's praising God they are rejoicing in the goodness of God it's kind of like the song service we just had here tonight that is the scene and then we read our verse verse 22 so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea they went out to the wilderness three days found no water and when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters for they were bitter now isn't it interesting in the same chapter that there's a song there's bitterness this beloved gives us the first understanding concerning bitterness that I want you to grasp here tonight and that is bitterness likes to hide behind smiling faces bitterness likes to hide behind kind words it likes to hide behind doing things for God or being involved in the kingdom. Here are the children of Israel in our text. They're singing a song to the Lord and just moments later, almost in the same breath, they're bitter. You know, it's possible to be here in church tonight having just worshiped God and yet bitterness can be in your heart second thing about bitterness, I want to share a few things and then we're going to look at a case study. second thing about bitterness is that bitterness destroys anything and any place where there is life. Our text says, think about this, our text says they could not drink the water because the water was bitter. How many know water is the most basic life-giving source on the planet? The Bible literally says that Jesus is the living water. The Holy Spirit is referred to as rivers of, of living water. And so the idea is water is the most basic life-giving source. Jesus is the life giver. This is why bitterness will destroy your relationship with God unlike anything else. Bitterness will destroy the church. Bitterness will destroy your marriage. Anything that is designed to be a life-giving source. Bitterness will try to kill it. Again, it is murderous and suicidal. The third thing kind of goes along with the first is bitterness likes to live beneath the surface. Over and over again, the Bible refers to it as a root of bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15 says, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up causing trouble. And by this, many become defiled. In other words, bitterness is a root. It's not the branches. It's not the leaves. It is the root that lives beneath the surface. In our text, bitterness was in the water. But how I many you know you would have never known that just by looking at the water? They first had to drink the water. Why? Because bitterness had worked its way on the inside of the water. Fourth thing concerning bitterness is bitterness always enlists other people. Bitterness likes to run in packs. A verse tells us that all the people murmured and all the people complained against Moses. Very interesting, bitterness points itself at the man of God. You know, bitterness or bitter people always have to tell people how they've been wronged. 
It's therapeutic, I guess. In other words, it's hard to keep bitterness to ourselves. I like to call it the bonding of bitterness. I used to smoke cigarettes for a while, and it was very interesting that whenever I wanted to go for a smoke break, I always invited somebody to come with me. You ever do that? You're like, hey, man, I'm going to go for a cigarette. You want to come? Or I see ladies do this when they, uh, they go to the restroom. They're like, hey, I'm going to go to the bathroom. You want to come with me? How <laughs> I many know that if men did that, if a guy got ready to go to the bathroom, like, hey, man, I'm going to go to the bathroom. You want to come? Like, whoa, whoa. Hey, man. It's just some things, you know, you got to do on your own, man. <laughs> In other words, what's the good of being bitter if you're not going to let anybody know about it? Fifth thing concerning bitterness, listen to me, is everybody has something to be bitter about. In other words, there's not a person here that if you wanted to, you could find something to be bitter about. Something in your past, some, something that was said, something that was done or not done. Uh, in other words, if you want to be bitter, uh, it is easy to find something that will make you bitter. Our text says that the water made them bitter. How many know when something as simple as water can make you bitter, anything can make you bitter? Yeah. The sixth and final thing is that bitterness alters your memory. In our text, this is a real problem that the children of Israel are facing. The inability to find suitable drinking water is a real problem. But how many know they had just experienced the Lord's incredible supernatural power over what? Water. God had just miraculously split the Red Sea. This was an unforgettable miracle, and yet they forgot you know the irony of this whole issue of bitterness is that it has to do with water because the children of Israel had just witnessed firsthand God's miraculous power of water and now they're complaining about not having enough water to drink you know bitter people always rewrite their history when spouses get bitter it's like they can't remember one good thing about their husband or wife not one like i've counseled people i'm like hey just just okay we've named all the bad qualities <laughs> just tell let's just make a list of the positive things and they're like oh uh, uh right now yeah yeah right now just write a uh can i come back tomorrow i'll bring the list i'll bring a I promise When people get bitter at the church, <laughs> they can throw away years of great memories just like that. I've seen people get up and give testimonies, and they were like, man, I so thank God for this church. I know it was God that brought me here, and they'll give the most powerful testimonies. But when they backslide, or they get bitter, like, that church... I'm like, hey, we got the baptism video. <laughs> oh, yeah, don't show that. Don't show that. Now, having laid all of that as a foundation, let me define bitterness for you. What is bitterness? Bitterness is the unresolved violation of your justice system. The unresolved violation of your own justice system. See, I would submit to you tonight that the strongest emotion in all of our beings is not love. It's not joy. It's not fear. The strongest emotion in every one of our beings, I believe, is the emotion of justice. In other words, we can survive people not loving us. We can survive loneliness. It's not good, the Bible says, but we can go on. But when our justice system is violated, and don't misunderstand me, God created us in his image. And no doubt one of the moral attributes of God is justice. But when our justice system is violated, then anything, any degree of rebellion, any attitude, any disobedience, we feel justified. A few years ago, you will recall we were having 
a bunch of police shootings and apparently at least videoed of shooting innocent people. Well, what happened after that? People begin to riot and kill police officers. And they felt justified doing it. Why? Because their own justice had been violated. When our justice is violated, then we feel like any rebellion is absolutely okay. Yeah. I've been wronged, so what I'm doing, oh, it may not be right, but it's justified. Yeah. There's two problems with our justice system. Number one is our perspective. See, God can see the end from the beginning. So when God looks at justice, he looks at the end to the beginning. See, we tend to lend, lend more on fairness. <laughs> Problem, though, is that fairness is subjective. Justice is eternal. So in other words, when we look at something that's happening, we say, God, that's not fair. It's not right, God. It isn't just, but God, who can see the end from the beginning, he says, take it, listen, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Bible speaks of a man named Asaph in Psalm 73. Asaph is a good man. He is serving God. He is the song leader in the church. He is a righteous man of God. But the Bible says that Asaph saw something that he felt was not fair. The Bible says uh, he's serving God, but he makes this statement. He said, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, it almost caused me to fall or slumble or to backslide. In other words, he says, here I am, God. I am serving God, but I saw something uh, that I don't think is fair. Uh, these people aren't going to church. They're not worshiping you. They're not tithing. And yet it looks like they're prospering. They have everything. They don't seem to have a care in the world. But God, here I am doing what you've asked me to do, doing right. And yet it's hard for me to even make end meets. My, it, that's not fair. Right. But see, Adaph, Ahab didn't have the pool. Asaph didn't have the full picture. And so what he perceived was an injustice was not really an injustice at all. He said, I did, because Asaph makes this statement. He said, I thought it was unfair until I went into the house of God. And he said, what did God show them? He said, God showed me their end. In other words, he said, God showed me, God gave me a glimpse that Asaph, you think it's all well, but listen, let me show you how the story ends. In other words, Asaph, you've read only part of the book, but there are other chapters you've not yet read yet. Listen, I don't always know what God is doing. I can't even always explain what's going on in my own life at any given time, but one thing I know and one thing I've settled in my mind is I know that God is just. The second problem with our justice is we have a very depraved nature. We have a fallen nature. So our justice is coming through a filter of depravity. Titus 1.15 says, To the pure, all things are pure, but to them that are defiled, nothing is pure. I asked him to get me a filter. This is kind of a makeshift filter, but pretend. A filter is designed to trap things. And so if this was an air filter and it was, the idea is if the filter's clean, if dirty air comes through, it is going to catch, the filter's going to catch it and what's going to come out on the other side? Clean air. If the filter is dirty, if clean air comes into a dirty filter, what's going to come out on the other side? Dirty air, our heart is a filter. Your heart is a filter. This is why it says if the heart is pure, it doesn't matter if all kinds of dirt and junk and violation and wrongdoing, if it comes to a pure heart, he says to the pure, all things are pure. But if the heart is defiled, it doesn't matter if the best intentions or the purest things come through. He says what's going to come through that dirty filter is nothing but dirt. Since our justice system is coming through a depraved filter, what we think, you know, that's not right, that's just not right, well, it may be right. 
it may actually be godly, yeah. but we feel like it isn't right. Yeah. If we cannot resolve it, what happens is we'll get bitter. The unresolved violation of your justice. In our text, they're in the middle, middle of a desert. They have gone three days without water. They start to proclaim, God, this isn't right. God, you bring us out here to die. Oh, yeah, we saw that little miracle thing you did, uh, that big deliverance, uh, but only to cause us to die in the will. God, it's not fair. And they cannot resolve it, and so they get bitter. Mara means bitterness. The Bible says in verse 24, and the people murmured. <laughs> it's an interesting word. We don't use it much today. What is murmuring? Murmuring means quiet complaining. Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't believe all that, man. I would say, oh, no, 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 no. I wouldn't talk about you. <laughs> yeah, I know the pastor said, but shh. Now, there's one other thing in this text that I want to point out, but we'll come back to it later because it has to do with the cure. I want to, for a moment, examine our opening text and look at a case study for bitterness. This man by the name of Ahithophel, and I'll just warn you, there's a lot of scripture, but I want you to see this thing unfold because it's kind of like a soap opera. You know, you don't even need to watch soap operas. Just read the Bible. It's the truest soap opera, I'm telling you. But just to give you a little backdrop, when we get to our text, David is the king, but he is about to lose his kingdom to his own son, Absalom. By the way, Absalom is one bitter man. He has an unresolved violation towards his father. If you know the story, his sister Tamar, uh, she had been raped by their, uh, half, by their brother Amnon. And the Bible says that David did not do anything about it. Uh, scripture tells us simply that when David found out what happened, he was just angry. But the thought in the Hebrew is that he did not do anything to punish Amnon because he loved him and apparently because it was his firstborn son. And so the Bible says that two years have now passed since this rape and David still has not done anything to punish Amnon. And so this bothered Absalom. He got upset. His resentment began to grow against his father. And all of a sudden the Bible says that Absalom decides, you know what, David, if you're not going to do anything about it, then I'll just handle it myself. Long story short, he works up this plot. He catches his, he asks his brother to come outside. And what he does uh, is he ends up, Absalom ends up murdering his brother Amnon. The Bible says that when David hears about this, what he does is he calls Absalom in and he kicks him out of the kingdom. He banishes him to a place called Gesher. And the Bible says, he tells him, get out, I want nothing to do with you. And Absalom basically says to David, wait a second here, this son of yours, Abnon, raped your daughter, you did nothing about it, I waited for two, two years, I finally brought justice and you kick me out. And that's where the root of bitterness begin to grow. Well, it's a violation of our justice system. This is how it plays out in families. It's how it plays out in churches. Oh, I got disciplined for that. But they did the same thing and mom and dad didn't do anything to them. Oh, I got sat down for ministry because of this, but... What they did was far worse, and nothing happened to them. Pastor didn't even address the issue. Well, pastor's playing favorites. Oh, they say that around here too? Oh, that's, that was an interesting little, I thought that was just at our church. It's not fair. It's not right. Can you feel the bitterness rising? Not only was Absalom bitter, but David was also bitter. The Bible says he did not even want to let his son back into his own house or kingdom for, after, for three years. After three years, long story short, David had a servant. His name was Joab. 
And Joab worked up this whole story. He finds this lady from Kokoa. And the Bible says she comes to David and she starts to tell him a story about her own son that was lost and banished and how God brought him back. But she made the statement. She said, even God does not banish someone forever. Right. 2 Samuel 14, 13. So the woman said, why have you schemed such a thing against the people of God? For the king speaks this thing as one who is guilty, and that the king does not bring his banished one home again. Verse 14, yet God does not even take away a life, but he devises means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. So she says all this. She says, she plays the card on David, even God. You're a man of, you're a man of God, right, David? So David says, okay. He decides to bring Absalom home. But you can, still, you can tell he's still bitter because in verse 24 of chapter 14, listen to what David says. And David said, let him return to his own house, but do not let him see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house, but he did not see the king's face. He says, okay, he can come home, but I don't want to see his face. <laughs> let me bring that to where we live. Oh, it's cool. I forgive them. They just better not say nothing to me. Are we cool? Oh, it's, I for, it's over. I, uh, they just better not come around me. In Jesus' name. Verse 28, Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem, but he did not see the king's face. Now, I want you to think about this because three years in Gesher, now two more years Here's a father and son that have not spoken to each other. They cannot even look each other in the eye for five years. Why? Bitterness. See, think about the separation bitterness has caused in this relationship. See, it's amazing to me when bitterness is involved. People who are once close can all of a sudden distance themselves for years. Remember back in Exodus, I told you one of the marks of bitterness is it destroys anything where there is life, namely relationships. But thank God, in our text, David gets his heart right. He forgives Absalom. 2 Samuel 14, 32. And Absalom said to Joab, now therefore let me see the king's face. Verse 33, so Joab went to David, told him, and David called for Absalom, and Absalom came and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. Then he kissed Absalom. Now, here's the picture. So David, where he says, okay, Absalom, come. And the Bible says that they go through this forgiveness gesture. David, the king, comes. Absalom bows himself before the king. David takes his hand. He kisses Absalom. And all of a sudden, this is supposed to be okay, man. It's cool. We're good. It's over. But remember I told you that bitterness likes to hide behind smiling faces. David is actually getting his heart right, but Absalom is not. He's just going through the motions. Have you ever, see, if you're saved, you can't just have an issue with somebody without the Holy Spirit dealing with you. It's impossible. If you're really saved, you can't just keep serving God with folks, and I don't talk to them. And the Holy Spirit's like, yeah, I understand. No, no, no. Holy Spirit, I don't be talking to them either, you know. You're going to have to get it right somewhere. And so David comes. Have you ever gone and you say, okay, God, I'm going to do this. You know, you work it all up. You're like, okay, God, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do And you go, you're like, hey, sis, I just want to let you know, you know, God's been dealing with me and this isn't right and I'm sorry. And they say, yeah, no problem. I'm sorry too. And it's all good. Peace, peace. Love you. And, and, and then you walk away, you walk away, you're like, it ain't over. Because you knew it was like, eh. We, we said all the right words. We went through all the right motion, but it's like a cloud. That thing is just still there. On the surface, it looks like they're both getting their hearts right. But Absalom's just going through the motions. There's still major bitterness in his heart. Because the Bible says he still wants to take David out. He really wants David's kingdom. And so out of his bitterness, 
he begins to turn the heart of David's men over to himself. Chapter 15, verse 4. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, and everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me. And listen to this. Then I would give him justice. So it was, whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take it and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward Israel, all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. In other words, people would come to the pastor or on their way to the pastor. They want to get some counsel. Absalom would interrupt them. And basically what he's thinking is he don't know nothing about justice anyway. And so he would interrupt them and say, I'll give you justice. I'll tell you what to do. What he was trying to do is steal the hearts of David's Men. It's interesting, the Bible says this was a 40-year process. Verse 7, now it came to pass after 40 years. Listen, that ought to wake us up right there. Bitterness can live beneath the surface for a long time. Verse 10, it says, Absalom spent, sent spies throughout the tribe of Israel and said, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigns. Verse 11, lock your mind in. And with Absalom went 200 men invited from Jerusalem. And they went along, what's that word say? Innocently. And they did not know anything. Remember I told you in Exodus, bitterness always has to enlist other people. And most of the time, those people are innocent. In other words, they have nothing to do with your situation. They don't really even know what's going on. But we're enlisting people uh, into our cause uh, and they're innocent. Uh, bitterness always has to plead its case. Bitterness always tries to turn the hearts of other people against the one we're bitter at. Uh, you know, I wonder how many innocent people have been lost because of the bitterness of others. Uh, verse 12, our story takes an interesting turn. Then Absalom sent for Ahithophel, here's our character, the Gilanite, David's counselor from his city, from Gilo, while he offered sacrifice, and the conspiracy grew strong. This, this Bible's a trip, man. For the people with Absalom continue to create. Okay, so Ahith uh, Absalom's got an issue with David. The Bible just said he called David's counselor, and when they came together, the conspiracy grew stronger. Now, how many heard the term birds of a feather? Apparently, Absalom knows something about Ahithophel that you and I don't know. Because Ahithophel is David's counselor. Listen, if I was going to try to take somebody out, I ain't going to call their right-hand man. Unless I know something about that right hand man, then maybe he's bitter also. Then maybe he's got an issue that I have. The Bible says the conspiracy grew stronger. Absalom says, go get a hit the fell, he'll join me. Not only did a hit the fell join Absalom, but Verse 20 says uh, of chapter 16, then Absalom said to Ahithophel, give advice to what I should do. Ahithophel tells him to basically go and violate his father's concubines and, and, and all the people will see that David's embarrassed and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But remember I told you the definition of bitterness, the uh, unresolved violation of your justice system. Now, think with me. If you have an unresolved violation of your justice system, what do you want? justice you want justice hey that's not right i want it to be right you want the person to get what they deserve now you and i know the bible says that vengeance is whose it is the lord's i will repay says the lord proverbs 24 29 says do not say i will do to him just as he has done to me yeah. but bitter people always seek their own justice bitter people i'm going to make you pay I'm going to make this right. I'll get even with you. And so Ahithophel comes up with a plan. He's going to shame David. Uh, and there's a lot involved. I, I won't go into it all. But we have to ask, because Ahithophel tells Absalom, listen, you go kill David. Then he says, wait a second, I'll do it myself. 
we have to ask the question, why was Ahithophel so bitter and why towards David? Let me say a few things about Ahithophel, then we're going to bring it out and we're going to pray. Before I tell you why he's so bitter, I want you to know that Ahithophel had a testimony as a saved man. Many things give us this picture. The Bible in our text actually says he has been sacrificing to God. He appears in acts of worship. He kept the law, the Bible says. He was a worshiper of God. He spoke for God. 2 Samuel 16, 23. Listen to these words. Now the advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was as if one had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the advice that Ahithophel. In other words, it said that when Ahithophel spoke, it was as if God himself was speaking. Listen, I've given I've give some counsel before and people say, thank you, pastor, that was God. But they didn't really mean that was God. <laughs> when Ahithophel spoke, they said it was as if the oracle of God. My point is, this is a saved man. This is a man who has relationship with God. He is a Christian. And yet bitterness was in his heart. That has to be one of the most incredible insights in all the Bible. Listen, you can have a bitter heart and yet still do the work of the Lord. I wonder how many of God's people, if you'd be honest, that describes you. Well, you're doing things for God. You're involved in the kingdom, perhaps even giving advice to other people. But internally, personally, there's unresolved issues. You weren't treated fairly. You feel like you've been overlooked or underappreciated, whatever the case may be. Here's a good man doing things for God, and yet he is bitter. Why? Interesting fact you need to know about of hit the fell if you can understand where the bitterness comes from. Second Samuel 11, 1 through 3. It's a text about David. And Bathsheba said it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the people of Amnon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed, walked on the roof of the king's house. From the roof he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman and someone said, listen to this, is this not Bathsheba? the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. The daughter of Eliam is very critical because Ahithophel is Eliam's father. In other words, Ahithophel is Bathsheba's grandfather. Uriah is his grandson-in-law. And so the whole thing with David is that this man, this was this man's granddaughter, Ahithophel was on David's counsel. He was a wise man, a very wise man. That's why David chose him to be his counselor. But you know the story. One night, David has this immoral encounter with Bathsheba that is Ahithophel's granddaughter. And now Ahithophel is on David's security council. He's in the inner circle. Bathsheba is now there living with David as well. But can you imagine, the Bible says that at this point, all the people would be singing, oh, David, David, he's such a man of God. Oh, David, he's got a heart after God, man. Oh, David, I mean, Saul slain thousands, but David has slain ten thousands. They're praising and worshiping David. They're talking about how great he is. And Ahithophel's watching all this. <laughs> Y'all don't know him like I know him. If you only knew. He's a whoremonger. What he did to my granddaughter wasn't right. Oh, David, David. And year after year, he's seen people and he said, you know what? This ain't right. They don't know what I know. It's a lot of time how bitterness works because we think we have some information on somebody that some other person don't have. If they only knew, well, and this made him very, very bitter. 
And it was out of that bitterness that he gave counsel, but thank God, God had his own counselor. He brought a man by the name of Hushai to give advice to Absalom. He said, listen, don't try to kill David. Listen, you need to repent. God sent him. Listen, God always has a messenger as well. And the Bible says that Absalom, when he heard Hushai, David's man, give it, he took Hushai's advice. And that's when our text says in 2 Samuel 17, 23, that when Ahithophel heard that his advice was not taken, he went to his house, got his affairs in order, and he hung himself. Because bitterness will always end up in suicide. Listen to me, listen to me. I don't care if it's physical or spiritual. If you've ever known anybody to commit suicide, I know it's the loss of hope. I get all the stuff. I get all the things, but I guarantee you that person left this earth with an unresolved issue at somebody. When you see people commit spiritual suicide, when somebody just ups and leaves the church, I'm out of here, or just walks away from their marriage, oh, they're bitter. They have an issue that they don't feel has been resolved. The root of every suicide. Again, Juan, this young man, Pastor, can you pray for me? I'm dealing with bitterness over and over again. Two things and we're going to pray, I promise. I was being interviewed for, to be uh, um, with the police, uh, our local police there. They were looking for a chaplain and they were interviewing me and I didn't even know if I'd do it. I didn't really have the time, but it's very interesting. As the guy was interviewing me, the police officer, he said, we have codes on the, on, on, you know, if you hear certain codes, he was giving me the numbers. One, four, five is this. One, eight, one is a homicide. And then he made this statement. He said, if you ever hear six, six, six on the radio, it means suicide. So that's interesting. Why? Because suicide is a demonic pact with Satan. Even in the police, they say suicide. If you hear it on the radio, 666, it's a suicide. You think Satan's not involved? I'll close with this. Turn with me, if you will, 2 Samuel 11. Or 2 Samuel 23, 34. I told you that Eliam was Bathsheba's father. Bible says David is at the end of his life. He writes down 37 men who he considered his mighty men. In other words, these are men who stood by David's side. They fought for him. They had his back. They were loyal and supportive of David. And here in verse 34, it reads, these, it's naming these men off. It says, Eliphat, the son of Ashabai, the son of Machathite, and Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gileadite. Eliam, hit the fell son. Bathsheba's father is listed here amongst David's mighty men. What does that tell us tonight? It tells me that what, whatever was not resolved with Ahithophel did get resolved by his son, Eliam. It's very interesting. Pastor Campbell tells me all the time, he says, you know, sometimes the parents can forgive, but their grandparents. There's people here, there's people I know they've gone through cancer and cancer made them bitter. There's other people go through cancer and cancer made them better. There's people here who have issues, man, they got relational issues, conflict, and they come out of it so bitter. And other people, they go through issues, they get closer to God, and they come out better. The same thing that made a hit that fell bitter made Elion better. He said, oh, I know what you did to my daughter. I get it, man. But you know what? Not only am I going to forgive you, I'm going to such support you and have your back that in your deathbed, when you're writing about the 37 people who stood by you the closest, I'm going to be one of them. I'm going to be one of them. Why? Because I am not going to let bitterness take me out. Are you bitter tonight? You say, well, how do I know, Pastor? How do I know? Are you willing to serve the people that have violated you? Because that's what it means to be a Christian. Jesus served Judas. Jesus served the very Romans who were crucifying him. And Jesus died for you and I. Yeah. He didn't deserve it. If anybody had a reason to get bitter, it would have been our Lord and Savior. 
He was so treated unfair. Back in Exodus, the miracle of that bitter water, what? Is they said, take the stick, throw it into the water, and when you do, the bitter waters will be made sweet. We all know that picture of that wood and that stick is a picture of the cross. The only way you deal with bitterness is you've got to come back to the cross. You've got to look at the cross and say, man, if Jesus, if Jesus, who was violated the most, can say, Father, forgive them, I don't really have an issue. I don't really have an issue. That's the cure for bitterness. I ask you to bow your heads with me tonight. God, we thank you for the grace of God, for the blood of Jesus. I so appreciate you.